Hi, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here speaking, and um, I was invited to speak about biometrics, that is uh, the scanning of eyes in humanitarian aid. So to be here talking about this topic is a matter of great responsibility, as people from African and Middle Eastern countries become once again a target and a projection screen in uh, Western countries in the form of the enemy, in the form of the terrorist threat, as xenophobia and as blunt racism. So, what does it mean to speak about humans by using the word refugee? The figure of the refugee ident identifies humans with the flight. The datafication of refugees turns them into digitized data sets. We have to be aware of what this means. It is a practice that works with, with statistical modeling techniques. It involves quantification, classification, and the construction of individuals and of populations that can be then managed. These constructed categories are never impartial or objective, but rather embedded in specific, local, and differing socio-political contexts. Humans are being made refugees by external events. It's not a natural or biological fact. These people are the undesirables, as anthropologist Michel Agier calls them, the unwanted, rejected, and displaced people of this world. The camps also fulfill the function of keeping people away from the wealthy nations, as the EU-Turkey deal, deal has made very clear. The definition of the refugee status is obviously political and the place of constant struggles over who is deserving and who is not. Very carefully, one must not fall into the trap of generalizations and problematize the politics around the term refugee and likewise digital refugee aid. Different from earlier politics of humanitarian aid and especially since the post 9-11 era, Refugees are being constructed as suspicious figures who consume a service rather than making use of their right to find shelter. Often, this symbolic figure of the refugee moves very close to the figure of the illegal or the terrorists, meaning that national security and migration have been brought in close connection. It makes it, for instance, possible to say if the European migration management and border systems are too weak, it endangers the security and the safety of the European countries and its citizens. It is in this political climate that biometric registration then needs to be looked at, I think. So, the eyes don't lie. There's two questions I want to discuss here. One. Is biometric registration really fortifying the human rights awarded to refugees, as the UNHCR claims? Two, which desire is connected with registering people? Let's look at the case of Jordan now, about which my colleague Christina Zuneden and me have done research that we published in the German newspaper Die Zeit. IrisGuard cooperates with the UN Refugee Agency. The company delivers the algorithm, the interface, and the hardware to perform iris recognition in refugee camps. Since 2013, all people arriving in the Jordanian camps, such as Zatari or Azraq, must register their irises. With the new digital and perfectly neoliberal strategy of the UNHCR to implement biometric registration in their camps, they have installed around 300 registration sites worldwide and scanned more than 2.5 million refugees in their public-private partnership with IrisGuard and many other vendors of biometric scanners. Back to Jordan now. Produced in an automated way, the barcode of the iris is uploaded to a cloud server named iCloud. From that moment, identities could be automatically recognized from any location in the world that houses these biometric machines, if there is a desire to do so, of course. That could happen in the form of being even remotely at a checkpoint 
or at an airport, for instance, and without the individual's knowledge. Thus, the UNHCR databases can potentially track, tag, monitor, and predict their movement. The mode of data mining is compulsory since receiving food and relief aid is in large parts distributed through cash-based assistance. Their scanned irises now replace cash or bank cards. The iris scans are also used for a system of cashless payment. The majority of refugees in Jordan live outside the camps in urban areas. They receive cash through iris scans directly through bank ATMs. In the camp, again, people buy their food at the camp's own supermarkets and pay with a wink of the eye. Iris scanners replace cash or credit cards. This biometric data is available for UNHCR and the World Food Programme. In fact, the World Food Programme uses this data for real-time consumer behavior assessment. It must be at one point also shared with the bank that is running the ATMs, the Cairo Amman Bank, for example, among others. The consumer data in the camps is, is, made, is, um, is made available to the grocery retailer, which is called Safeway Jordan, who runs the two supermarkets. Any third party has to access iCloud's interface at one point in order to make a transaction. They say it is encrypted, but obviously any encryption has vulnerable spots. Supporters say it gives the refugees their dignity back because they can choose what they want to buy. Although there's obviously truth in this claim, the idea to disperse cash or credit cards through iris scanning or iris scanners where possible, turns the digitized people as refugees into consumers of refugee aid, with the constant danger of misuse and leaks. So in what setting does UNHCR operate? Nation states are the only actors that can grant asylum. Most of the states do so on the basis of the 1951 Refugee Convention, that defines who's a refugee and what rights and obligations they have. Depending on the circumstances in each country where it operates, the UNHCR takes on quasi-state roles in order to protect and assist refugees as privacy international rights. And I quote, UNHCR operates in more than 100 countries around the world in many different jurisdictions, with many different authorities, host societies, local communities, widely differing and often very difficult environments. Many refugee hosting countries have neither privacy or data protection laws, nor authorities that would enforce them. And while UNHCR can determine in guidelines how it deals with personal data and benefits from privileges and immunities as any other UN institution, Refugees have the duty to conform to the laws and regulations of their host country. And, importantly, many of these host countries are developing their own surveillance systems. Often funded by Western governments and development foundations, um, governments across, across Asia, Africa and Latin America are developing population registers, biometric registers, electronic medical registries, amongst others, and the governments are, very, are becoming very keen to bring UNHCR data into their own systems. So digital IDs enabled by biometrics would save the nation state billions of dollars in subsidies. It's an often used argument by one of the said so-called development foundations, such as the World Bank Group. Here's a quote from a 2006 report from UNHCR Malaysia. And I quote, Nang Piang, a refugee from Myanmar, placed his finger tentatively on the biometric scanner, that is, the fingerprint scanner. I don't know what it is for, but I do what UNHCR wants me to do, he said. From the same report, this is an important step for UNHCR Malaysia as we strengthen the security of our registration system to prevent fraud said Volker Turk, head of UNHCR in Malaysia. And again, such a security measure 
will certainly enhance the credibility of UNHCR's registration systems in the eyes of the Malaysian government. I think this statement illustri illustrates above-mentioned links of biometrics with the interests of national governments. Fair enough, the justifications for biometrics also refer to faster and more precise registration and better refugee assistance. But another reason, as the quote indicates, is also to prevent fraud in the form of double registrations and thus the reception of double aid. In my opinion, legitimizing the introduction of biometrics with fraud prevention stands for a shift in the image of refugees. People who flee are now under blanket suspicion of being con artists and not first and foremost people who seek protection and shelter. This ambition, th sorry, <laughs> this suspicion is embedded in the current political climate and xenophobic developments that refers to pejorative uses of the slogan economic migrant. All refugees that take the risky journey to Europe are economic migrants, suggesting that, quote, people are trying to play or cheat the systems, that their very presence is the cause of problems at the border, and that if we could only filter them out, order would be restored. End of quote from a Guardian article by Daniel Trilling. The UNHCR's 2018 estimate is that around 68 million people were forced to flee their homes. More refugees and eternally displaced persons than ever before, but 86% of these remain in the so-called developing world, not in wealthy regions such as Europe. Millions now live in refugee camps. Many have been there for decades. As camps become encamped cities, they create new forms of urban governance. I want to give you another context of the term humanitarian intervention and the connotation of the camp with Michel Agier. He has been thoroughly researching the lives in refugee camps in the Middle East and North Africa, and he writes, humanitarian intervention borders with policing. There is no care without control. With this quote, I do not intend to polemically question the role of the UN Refugee Agency in general. It is very clear that their support is of crucial importance. However, what I want to draw your attention to is that there is this ambivalence between care and control embedded in the term humanitarian intervention itself. This enables a special mode of social organizations that runs with and through humanitarian governance. In the last decades, this form of governance has become more occupied with migration control and management than with protection, Michel Agis argues. In the camps, given the control systems already in place, Biometrics are a further tool that renders new forms of intervention and governance possible. As sociologist Katja linskov jakobsen says, I think this is a critical, a very important point. The new form of intervention over lives, that is, control through information, does never render the older forms, older power relations of intervention obsolete. Rather, it is adding up, I think. There's this enormous power imbalance when you consider that the UNHCR has the biometric data of millions of people at its disposal, and they continue to scan. The context of insecurity, sorry, states of emergency and urgency makes all actions taken by the UNHCR by definition an undertaking under unsafe circumstances. That's precisely why the use of experimental technologies like biometrics in this insecure context is very, very problematic, as I think. Technological experiments are performed and legitimated with reference to this emergency, necessitating that something must be done and it must be done urgently. It is in this setting that the camps are serving as laboratories <laughs> for testing new and unsafe technologies. 
vulnerable people who fled have become life test subjects and no one really has a choice to opt out. As the digitized refugee body opens up new possibilities of intervention, new data sharing practices and policies emerge as a crucial issue, according to Katja Linskov Jakobsen. But it took until 2015 that the UN Refugee Agency published its first data policy for refugees. The policy sounds good because it states that agreements to process biometric data and other data must be given informed and freely. But the, cons the, the compulsory connection of biometric data with the acknowledgement as refugee contradicts this, I think. As you cannot, as you cannot opt out, is this a free decision? A 2006 UNHCR internal audit found that in four out of five reviewed country operations, the information being given to refugees about the biometric program was insufficient for them to be properly informed. By the way, in said audit, they didn't bother to interview actual registered people, but just the UNHCR stuff on the ground. Furthermore, the policy is notably vague on which implementing parties and third parties may access data and does not address what restrictions apply to third-party data access. And given the many third parties, private companies, donors, banks, host states, and even the states that people just have fled from, misuse is always possible. Under these conditions, it is very problematic that no alternative to scanning is offered. These databases can have life-threatening consequences if they fall into the wrong hands. Under these conditions, it is very... Okay, that <laughs> I already had. UNHCR is well aware of this, but it remains to be a huge dilemma. Privacy International writes, and I quote, pro-Assad groups such as the Syrian Electronic Army have successfully hacked into well-defended systems in the past. Imagine if they wanted to gain access to these databases. As refugees are slowly becoming consumers, the boundaries between humanitarian aid and commercial interests are blurring. Humanitarian aid more and more becomes a business with constant monitoring and ev evaluation sheets, assessment protocols, data collection and checklists. Here's an example to give you an idea. In 2016, the UN World Humanitarian Summit took place in Istanbul for the very first time. During the summit, a huge exhibition fair took place with over 600 companies from the whole world presenting their humanitarian products. Among them, vendors of drones next to a MasterCard representative and big accountant companies such as Accenture. Even workers of the travel portal TripAdvisor attended a panel on flight routes. In and as well outside the camp, the growing interest of the private sector and tech company in the so-called developing markets reframes the world's poor people as entities of untapped markets. The logistics of connecting them to global capital, giving them an ID number and a biometric barcode is a novel way of generating profit. It is also the entrance gate into online and offline labor markets, which is not per se a bad thing. Many people who fled want to work to be more independent, obviously. But considering the neoliberal climate in which UNHCR acts, it is important that the people don't become objectified as cheap labor and as mere resources. That would be nothing more than a continu con continuation of the Western prosperity model, which has, since colonialism, as we know, been based on the global south as the cheap raw material supplier and outlet for products. In an increasingly neo neoliberal climate that seeks to minimize costs, rationalize its procedures and maximize profits, New technologies such as biometrics, 3D printing, drones and robots are introduced in order to innovate but also to save money for the always underfunded aid agencies. It is doubtful if that's really the case, as software needs to be updated and maintained constantly. The appraisal of this technology of innovation and of big data as the new gold or the new oil of the 21st century the compulsory datafication and the linking of identities with online databases is putting people at risk. How can you and HCR and its cooperation partners make sure that people won't be ex exploited, their privacy will be guaranteed, and that digital systems are not surveillance systems? 
Thank you.